Okay, I guess we can start. Hope that you can hear me loud and clear. Hello, everyone. I know that we are after lunch. I know that probably we are a little bit sleepy, so I'm going to try to entertain you for upcoming 45 minutes. Let's see how it goes. Hope it's going to be nice. Um, so, my name is Bartek, and I'm working as a senior manager uh, at Pega Systems. And today, as you can imagine, I'm going to be talking about chaos or I'm going to be talking about embracing chaos and chaos engineering. Now, as a quick warm-up, uh, chaos engineering, who have ever heard about this and who know what it is? Please raise your hands. Awesome, plenty of people. Now, who is working in the organization that is actually using chaos engineering? Wow, oh, there is one person, that's nice. So I hope that, you know, after, after this presentation, there are going to be more of us doing that uh, during next year uh, when we're going to meet at the same conference, hopefully. Um, so there are three things, actually, I would like to achieve with this uh, presentation. So one is about what the chaos engineering is. So principles of chaos engineering, uh, what's the baseline of, uh, of this approach, um, how you can actually run a very simple uh, chaos engineering experiment in your organization. So, basics about chaos engineering. That's the first thing. The second thing I, I would like to achieve is to explain you why you should be doing chaos engineering. And this is not only for you. This is actually something that you can use in a discussion with other people in your organization when you're going to start convince them that, hey guys, we should start doing that. So we're going to be talking a little bit about money, a little bit uh, about resiliency in general, answer to question why. The third thing that I would like to achieve with this presentation is that I would like to show you a very, very simple use case. Uh, how fast you can actually run chaos engineering experiment for super simple case. Hopefully you're going to be having um, a time for that. But yeah, it's going to be super simple, so don't expect too much. And let's start with the first thing that I've mentioned. So, with chaos, slide. <laughs> yeah, as you can see, this is a great example of chaos, by the way. Um, so, uh, we're going to be talking first about chaos theory. Why? Because chaos theory is actually a baseline for chaos engineering. And uh, let me start with reading a definition of chaos theory. This is actually something that uh, Edward Lawrence, who is actually inventor of this, uh, this theory, came up with. So let me, let me quickly quote him. So, when the past determines the future, but the approximate present does not approximately determine this future. It sounds a little bit tricky, but in fact, this is very simple. So, Basically, when you have a dynamic system, this dynamic system is having some initial conditions. And for a very long time, the thinking was that small change to those initial conditions is going to produce uh, end results that are changed only slightly. Now, chaos theory is saying that small change to initial conditions is actually can cause very huge difference in the end results of this dynamic system. And we're going to be talking about some examples from real life, so I hope that you're going you're gonna to understand better about that. Now, it all started a while ago. Uh, it was 1903, and the first person who actually realized that dynamic systems can be chaotic, at, at that point, th this word was not in use, but um, he was talking about sensitive dependencies of initial conditions. It was a mathematician called, uh, and I'm going to try to pronounce his surname, Poincar. Uh, after that, people forget about his theory. And the person who came back to that was actually Edward Lawrence. So Edward, Edward Lawrence, he was actually a mathematician. That's the one thing what he was doing. But also, he was a meteorologist. And he was working on weather predictions, which, as you can probably know, can be accurate or not. There is some accuracy when you're watching, let's say, TV and they're saying about the weather. Yeah, they're saying more or less accuracy, uh, how certain they are about, about the prediction. So this is what, uh, what Lawrence has been doing. And 
at some point, uh, it was, I guess, 1960, he was running some experiment. He was using um, a computer to run this experiment, and uh, the, the computer was doing some calculations for prediction of weather. At some point, in the middle of this experiment, uh, there was some kind of error, and experiment has stopped. So what Lawrence did, he actually took variables at that point of experiment, and instead of running it from scratch, he started from the middle. When he came back after an hour or two, he realized that end results was not something that he was expecting. So what he did, he reran the same experiment starting from scratch. And again, the results in both cases were super different. Now what happened, he started thinking what, what actually happened, what, what, was, what is the cause of that? And he realized that when he put initial conditions from the middle of the experiment, actually rounding happened. Instead of using six digits after comma, computer used three digits, which caused a small change. And the small change actually ended up with results that were, that were super different from what was expected. So then he realized that this dynamic system is actually a chaotic one. And he started working on that. Uh, he was working for a while um, on uh, trying to understand what is actually happening. And in 1972, if I recall correctly, uh, he actually had a talk at a conference about that. That was a summary of his work. And uh, the title of this uh, talk was Predictability. Does the flap of butterfly wings in Brazil set of a tornado in Texas? And probably some of you heard about butterfly effect. How many of you have ever heard about this one? Yeah, from the movie or yet. Yeah, it's it's very popular one. So this is actually re related to chaos um, to chaos theory. Uh, one thing that I wrote in the intern, I don't know if this is actually true, but uh, it was supposed to be some kind of bird instead of butterfly. But he decided to go with butterfly, but it's more romantic. Yeah. So that's. I don't know if this is true, but uh, this is what I what I read somewhere. So, butterfly effect actually explains chaos theory very well. Yeah? So, a small thing can have a huge impact on the end result. And if you think about it, chaos theory is actually everywhere. So, weather is a great example. Yeah? Um, and th there is one important thing to understand about chaos theory. Chaos theory is not is not talking about random systems. Chaotic systems and random systems are, are different. There's a very subtle difference, but there is a difference. So in chaos systems, if you know all the variables in your system, you can predict the future. So like with weather, you would have 100% accuracy with predicting weather if you know all the variables around the world, like temperature of seas, like um, what is actually happening with the air in different parts of, of the globe, and then, only then, you can predict with 100% uh, the weather at this particular point of time. So this is chaotic system. For random systems, you cannot do that. So there is this subtle difference. So weather, that's the one thing. Where, where else we also see um, chaos and chaotic systems? Actually, in our lives, we see that. Uh, like, I don't know if you're, uh, you're fans of uh, life coaches on, or people like that, uh, but there's one guy called Simon Sinek, who's actually very popular, and he's, uh, he's, uh, he's having very brilliant observations. And uh, in one of his talks, he actually said that what makes difference in our lives are small habits. Yeah? So let's say if you're going, to, you, you, go, you, you want to go to gym, yeah? and to do, you do that 12 hours every month. Yeah? It won't make a difference. You won't see a difference in the shape of your body. Instead, if you go every day, 15 minutes, that's the consistency. Yeah? So the small things repeated are actually going to uh, have an impact on your life. Where else? Medicine. I don't know if, you, if you're aware, but uh, there is a research about uh, predicting uh, heart attacks. And this is actually very close to chaos theory. Why? Researchers conducted that 
normal pace of your heart is actually very chaotic. This is a chaotic system because it depends on how deep you're breathing, what you've been doing, how fast uh, blood is running through your vessels, things like that. And they claim that heart is, heartbeat is not steady. Why is that? Because if an unexpected thing occurs, then the heart is prepared for that. It can react. The more steady beat of heart, the higher risk of heart attack, because heart is not prepared for that kind of extreme situations. The other interesting thing from medicine is actually about scars. Uh, when you make a cut, a surgeon makes a cut, and it's a clear line, straight line, it's actually not healing and won't be looking as well as the cut that is in a W shape. They don't know why, but this is something that, uh, that uh, they found in research. Um, so, yeah, talking about butterfly effect, I, of course, forgot to put this one on the screen. There is one more place where you're going to see chaos theory in pop culture. Who knows the movie? Yeah, Jurassic Park, exactly. So, <laughs> yeah, so in Jurassic Park, uh, this guy here is, uh, he's called in the movie Ian, Ian Malcolm, if I recall correctly. He's actually an expert, chaos theory, theory expert, and he's explaining uh, chaos theory using a drop of water on hand. Yeah. So you can see that in pop culture. And now, why we're talking about chaos theory? We're supposed to be talking about chaos engineering. So the reason is simple. IT systems, distribute, especially distributed systems, are chaotic systems. So think about um, some distributed system that is, that is using microservices. Yeah? This is actually something, this is a system where you have so many conditions that very small change in latency can cause disruption for the whole system or can change behavior of the system. And this is not only about technical stuff. Uh, th this is nice to realize that as well. This is also about uh, people and the influence of people on, on the code that people are writing. So let's imagine that you woke up and you didn't drink your coffee and you said you wrote some kind of code and this code is going to have, be having a bug because you didn't sleep well at night, yeah? And this is going to actually affect the whole system in which your service is going to be running. This is a typical chaotic system, so this is why we're talking about this. So, now, chaos engineering, a definition. What is that? Chaos engineering is the discipline of experimenting on a distributed system in order to build confidence in the system's capability to withstand turbulent conditions in production. So this is official definition, but in short. You take your system, you introduce chaos, you introduce failure, and you observe how your system is behaving. That's, that's how chaos engineering works. Why would we like to do that? We're going to be talking more about that a mm, couple of slides uh, forward, but you want your, to have your system resilient. You want to have your system to be prepared for unexpected things. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples what kind of uh, unexpected situations you uh, were actually there in a, uh, in a real life scenarios. So this is basically the definition of chaos engineering. And all of that uh, has been started in 2008 by Netflix. So at that point, Netflix started moving to, uh, to AWS from their own data centers. And one very important thing about AWS at that point was is that it was not that stable. Um, and the same year, I think they, they, they haven't moved yet uh, to, to AWS when this happened. They had a three days outage. At that point, the, the main uh, source of their earnings was about selling DVDs. So they, they had a massive outage. And after that, they realized that they, they need to prepare their system for unexpected things. So what they did, they created a team which was focused on that. And that was basically the beginning of chaos engineering. Um, the first tool that they provided was called Chaos Monkey. So nice name. And so you can imagine that this tool was basically introducing chaos to their system. And in this case, it was about uh, AWS. So Chaos Monkey, you give a, a machine gun or shotgun to the monkey. You put the monkey and close it into your data center. And that and monkey is uh, destroying your instances, your computers, randomly. 
So basically, th this is what this tool was doing. Uh, then they introduced uh, something that they called a Simeon army. So they basically added more tools, like Chaos Gorilla, Chaos Kong, so f fancy names. Um, they were simulating outage of availability zones or even whole regions. Uh, actually, Chaos Monkey is, uh, is available on GitHub. I guess they released that on 2011 or something like that. In 2014, they introduced official role of Chaos Engineer. Uh, then, uh, in 2016, uh, Gremlin has been created. This is actually a tool for chaos engineering. Yeah, uh, It's a commercial one, you can use it, but it's very, very popular. Uh, and the most mature one, I would say. Uh, it has been actually created by uh, people who are working at Netflix on chaos engineering. Uh, then the people from Gremlin uh, launched first conference about chaos. Uh, in 2018, in 2020, AWS introduced AWS Fold Injection Simulator. In between, there were many tools created uh, aiming exactly for that. Uh, what we have right now? So we can say that Netflix is using Chaos Engineering. We know that already. But who else? It's actually everywhere. So there, is, uh, there are different companies using that from different fields. So there is a Twitch eBay, Vishnepl, don't just eat, uh, Telecom, Orange, T-Mobile, uh, financial institutions like Goldman Sachs, like uh, Santander, which is not appearing on the screen. Sorry for that. Uh, Santander, uh, Disney, Slack, Under Armour, Walmart, so the biggest uh, biggest uh, shops in the US, Uber. Alaska Airlines and even US Air Forces. They are also using uh, chaos engineering. You can read about that, yeah. If you just Google it, you're gonna find some nice, uh, nice articles about this. So, um, talking about principles of chaos engineering, there are five principles. Um, again, defined by people who are working uh, on Netflix at that point uh, on chaos engineering. So first, the hypothesis that we built is around steady state behavior. What does it mean? Steady state behavior is basically the state in which your system is behaving normally. What the normal behavior of your system is, you have to think about it. You have to define it. But we're going to be talking about it a little bit more on the next slide. Uh, very real-world events. Basically, you want to make sure that your system is prepared for real-world real events, not something that is very artificial, but rather something that can really happen. So this is the uh, this is the second thing. The third one, run experiment in production. Yes, I know it might sound scary, but this is the end goal of that. Yeah, production is the system that your clients are using. You cannot. Okay, you can run it on staging. You can run on on your uh, dev systems. And this is let, let's face it. This is where most of the people are starting from. Yeah, you cannot run chaos experiment on production unless you already did some experiments on dev staging or whatever lower environments you have. But the end goal is to run it on production. And I've heard that in Netflix they are doing that, actually. So they are basically telling teams, hey guys, today we're going to be running some experiment. And they just do that on production. They observe what is happening. Um, automate experiments to run continu continuously. So this is a DevOps conference. So this is a very good point as well. We do not want to run those experiments once a year. We want to have them to be a part of our our pipelines or whatever we have, yeah? Our continuous, uh, continuous delivery process. Minimize blast radius. What is blast radius? Blast radius is actually, you can think about the bomb that you're dropping and there is some area impacted, yeah? So you don't want to break the whole system at once, yeah? You rather try to minimize, uh, at least in the beginning, these um, affected areas of your experiment. So those five things are basically principles. And there is also a nice quote from Nora Jones, who is, uh, I don't know if she's still working on Netflix, to be honest, but uh, she was working on chaos engineering um, in this company. So chaos engineering doesn't cause problems, it actually reveals problems. What else about principles? Before you even start thinking about doing chaos engineering, think about your system, think about your service. Is it, have you fixed all known bugs? If not, do not think about engineering. First, let's make sure that you fix all b known bugs that you have. If you have this, the second question you should ask yourself, do you have 
steady state monitoring. So I've said about steady state. Yeah, steady state is a as I've said normal behavior of your system. Yeah, you can define the normal behavior of your system under normal load only if you have observability for your system. So some kind of KPIs that are gonna tell you what is let's say um, latency for your system. Uh, what is the um, how much CPU is in use? Yeah, things like that that actually allows you to describe the steady state. And you also have an, you need to have an observability for that. Once you have it, you're confident about your system resiliency, do chaos engineering. And a typical chaos engineering experiment looks like that. So you have the steady state, you make hypotheses. So let's say, if I'm going to kill all my EC2 instances, or EC, in general, instances in my, uh, in my system, it's going to survive and it's going to automatically be back within one minute or something like that. This is a hypothesis you make. Then you run the experiment, so you basically kill the instances. You verify if your hypothesis is not right or you see some other side effects, you improve, you rerun experiment to cover that. Very simple. It's, it's not like, it's not rocket science. And this covers part one. What is chaos engineering? Second, why? So, from the success point of view of your product, of your organization, of your company, in the context of chaos engineering, I would like to talk about things, resiliency, money, and reputation. This is why you should be doing chaos engineering. Let's start with the first one, resiliency. And by resiliency, I not only Having, I'm not only having in mind the resiliency of, from the technical point of view. And of course, in a dream world, if you sleep at night, no one should be calling you at 2 a.m. If there is some kind of unknown problem in your system, your system should heal itself. You should wake up in the morning, read emails, read some notifications. Hey, I know that there was some disruption, but I healed myself, yeah? No one called you, you should be happy. And this is, of course, a dream world. Uh, I mentioned that this is not only about technical res resiliency, but this is also resiliency is important also from the people aspect. So no one likes to be called at 2 a.m. No one likes to be a, on a stressful calls with clients. No one likes to be explaining why something is not working. No one likes to be working on fixing bug that is impacting production uh, under a hurry. So resiliency is not only about technical, but also about people aspect. Yeah? The better resiliency, the better organizations in, organization in general. Uh, on the screen you can see um, a chart. This is actually taken from a report about chaos engineering from, uh, from Gremlin that I've mentioned previously, Gremlin uh, organization, about number of uh, CEV1 uh, and CEV0 incidents uh, on average, so as you can see, 20% are having 10 to 20 every month, and about 80% are having 1 to 10. And there is uh, one example that I wanted to give you very quickly about the blast radius of a problem that can happen in one uh, company that can have uh, have the effect on other companies as well. What you can see on the screen is actually from down detector. This is, uh, there are different systems and number of incidents reported. As you can see, there is this line that is going up. And this is actually taken at 2021. And December, if I recall correctly, 7th of December. At that time, AWS had a huge outage. You probably heard about it, or maybe even you've been impacted by that. Who, who was impacted by this one? So at least a couple of people. So it actually had a, had a huge impact on uh, other services. So, so as you can see, McDonald's, SiriusXM, League of Legends, um, Smartsheet, Alexa, Disney, everything was having, all systems are, were having problems at that time. Uh, I remember the Ticketmaster, they also were affected by that and they postponed selling uh, tickets for Adele tour uh, Adele is the singer, to, uh, to the next day, and fans get angry because of that. Uh, Roomba um, cleaning machines, 
they were not able to actually clean houses and people were mad about that. I also read a funny story about a cat feeder who was connected to cloud as well and couldn't feed a cat. So that's like, a, that's really crazy eh, what can happen. Um, actually, uh, AWS had a two, uh, two days when they had the problems. It was 7th of December and also 10th of December and the impact was huge. So this is the first thing about resiliency. Um, on reputation. I don't have this chart here on the on slides, but actually I read about some survey uh, and people were basically saying how many seconds should website has been thinking about loading some content for you to decide that it's broken. And I guess the average was 10 seconds, something like that. So if for 10 seconds you see that website is not loading the content, you immediately starting to see to, to think that this website is not working. Now, this is also about reputation because right now, if you want to buy some product, you type it in Google, you're probably gonna see dozens of shops selling the same product for a similar price. Probably you're gonna pick the first choice on the list if the price is the same. And let's imagine that this website is loading for 20 seconds. You immediately gonna drop this out, you're gonna choose the next shop on the list. Yeah, its price is the same. So why not? This is about reputation. This, this shop A, yeah, that was first on the list, is losing, losing that client, and most probably this client won't, won't come back. That's very simple. Now, my favorite topic, the third one, money. Um, let's do a quick, uh, quick uh, survey. How many dollars you think one minute of downtime cost in average. Anyone? Let's guess. One minute, one minute. One minute, not one hour. This, this here is about one hour. I'm talking about one minute. It depends, but it, there, there, are some, there are some research about the average value. So uh, this is pretty high to be honest. I was expecting something smaller. It's not that, not that bad. So one minute depending on research. Uh, Gartner in 2014 they made some research. They are saying it's $5,600 of one minute of downtime in average. There is other research for some kind, from some kind of institute. What she's saying is uh, 9,000 if I recall correctly. So in average we can say it's 7,000 something like that for one minute of downtime. So Again, as you can see, 80% of, uh, of companies are having a mean time to resolution between one hour and 12 hours, yeah? And of course, it can be one hour, it can be 12, so it's, it's a huge difference, yeah? But still, 40% are, uh, are having that kind of uh, numbers. And talking about hours, I wanted to show you those statistics. This is average cost per hour this time, of downtime from two different years, 2019 and 2020. So in both years, 25% of companies, one hour of uh, cost of downtime between 300,000 to 400,000. It's, it's pretty significant, I would say. For 17%, you have more than 5 million. Um, in August 2016, Delta Airlines, they had an outage five hours, they lost 150 million. So this is very from different industries are going to be having a different, uh, different numbers here. Yeah. If you are a big shop that is like Amazon that is selling lots of lots of things, you're going to probably lose more than a small company uh, during the same uh, time of downtime. But basically chaos engineering is about saving money. So if you're going to if you would like to convince someone in your organization, hey, do we, should we invest money in chaos engineering? You can show that. Probably it's gonna help you a lot. So, this covers part number two. So we said what is chaos engineering and why we should be doing it. Now I would like to give you a very quick um, and very short demo on how you can actually run very simple uh, chaos engineering experiment. Before we jump into that, uh, there are a number of tools out there that you can use. I mentioned about Gremlin, which is the most popular, but it's also pretty expensive. 
uh, but there are also some uh, some other tools. Uh, some of them are free. So like you have a Chaos Blade, Chaos Toolkit, Chaos Mesh, um, and also AWS. They have introduced, as I mentioned previously, in 2020. AWS Fold Injection Simulator. So this is a service for running chaos engineering experiments in cloud. And uh, this is something that I would like to use for this demo because it's very simple uh, to run this experiment. And also AWS is very near and dear to my heart. So uh, we're going to try to do that. Now, what we're going to do? EC2 based website. Load balancer, auto scaling group. That's it. This is what we're going to deploy. And let me now do that. Hope you see my screen. That's great. So I'm going to run Terraform apply. So deploy this. And of course, for those who are familiar with Terraform and AWS, we are having some configuration about uh, provider. We're also having some configuration about the AMI that we're going to use. We're having some security group, launch configuration, VPC config, subnets, ALB, ALB listener, target group, auto scaling group. And this auto scaling group, what is very important for our experiment, is actually going to add some tags to um, to our instances that we're going to be having. How many instances should be there? We have a uh, max size set to four, but desired capacity is two. And now we should wait for this to be, um, to be actually deployed, and this is going to probably take two minutes or something like that. So before we jump into, uh, into that, let me very quickly jump into console and let me show you how a uh, fold injection simulator looks like actually uh, from the console. So this is a very simple service that you can use. And basically, if you want to run experiment, you of course, as I mentioned previously, you, you should make some hypothesis. So in this case, what we're going to try to do is that we're going to just terminate EC2 instances uh, and the hypothesis is that we gonna, our website is actually going to survive, yeah? because after a while, EC2 instances should be recreated by, um, by our auto-scaling group. So with a few clicks, you can actually create template experiment. And what you need to specify is action that you want to run. That's the one thing. Now, what kind of action types you have? So uh, what is nice with AWS Fold Injection Simulator is actually it is having a set of, uh, set of actions that you can do, um, targeting different resources. So for example, for EKS, you, have, uh, you can simulate CPU stress, you can delete pods, you can simulate some memory stress, things like that. That's the one thing. Um, for RDS, uh, not that much. Uh, what is interesting for us is EC2 instances. What we want to do, we want to terminate those instances. Um, they're adding a new action types for this service. Uh, so what we have here probably is going to be changed in the future. When I was using that like two years ago, there were definitely less action types they are, uh, they are providing right now. So we have action. Uh, our target uh, name has been auto-populated, so let's click Save, and now let's say what, which instances we should target here. What we're going to do is actually that we're going to target um, instances that are having the given tag. So let me get back here. We're going to try to attack those that are having tag to be destroyed, set to true. That's the one thing. The second thing that we're going to add, we're also going to add a filter. And this is going to be exactly the filter that they are suggesting here. We want to um, target instances that are actually in running state. We don't want to target uh, instances that are terminated or stopped already. So let's click Save. We also need to 
uh, attach some IAM role. I have one predefined, so you can do that. There is a, a documentation how you can set up your uh, fold injection simulator. Let's create. And we have our experiment. Now, hopefully my stack is deployed. Yes, it is. So let's go right to EC2 and let's go directly to load balancers. I'm going to just copy its DNS name. And hopefully we should see logo here. Yep, we have it. Uh, of course, behind the scenes we have uh, two instances. Do we have also two terminated, but those two are running. They're having a tag set, the mentioned one, to be destroyed, set to true. So, one more thing about experiment. We need observability. So, I have some handcrafted observe PI script, which is going to basically hitting the given address and it's going to return response. If there is a response different than 200, it's going to be calculating how many seconds the website is down. That's it. So we have brain simple observability here. Yeah. So we have this. Let's try to run our experiment then. So we go here. We go to our template. That's the one. We click start experiment. That's it. We just wait for this experiment to run. And hopefully, if everything is set up right, we should see success here very soon. Come on. All right, this one is completed. And yeah, we start in seeing the gradation of the responses for our, for our website, yeah? Now the expectation is that this website is going to actually survive. Yeah, we see two instances shooting down. Let's wait. How fast is it going to recover? It's not that, not that fast, to be honest. So now let's imagine that someone is using this website, yeah? You can't connect to house, you can't buy things. It's problematic. It's starting to catching up, hopefully, or maybe not. Yeah, we have one, uh, one instance already running, but it's not serving content properly. Let's wait a little bit more. But in general, with every tick, with every second, we're losing money. So we've been talking about how much every minute of downtime costs, yeah? So in this case, this is a great example of uh, 87 seconds. So yeah, we lost a little bit more than $7,000 right now, yeah? Now, is hi hypothesis uh, right? Yes, it is, because our website survived. Yeah, it's back. You don't have to wake up and, and create DC2 instance manually. But at the same time, it reveals that it could be better. So now you should start questioning your own, your own service. Is it the technology that you use is right, yeah? Website based on EC2 instances, is it the is it right approach? Probably not. But, I want, but I, what I wanted really to show you is actually um, how easy you can set up chaos experiment using AWS Fold Injection Simulator. That was the main purpose of, uh, of this experiment here. So, with that being said, that would be it from me. Thank you so much, and waiting for questions.